Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have a guest I have long wanted to speak with that we finally found the time to reach out to, and fortunately, he is up for an interview. He is a senior lecturer on statistics at Harvard University with a PhD in statistics, also from Harvard. He's one of the world's leading experts on chess ratings and has been the chairman of the U.S. Chess Ratings Committee since 1992. He is the inventor of the Glico and Glico 2 rating systems, versions of which are used on Lee Chess and Chess.com, both, <clears throat> excuse me, amongst many other gaming sites. Uh, he's also a USCF master, so he knows his subject well, and we'll get a bit into his chess towards the end. And he's written and co-written several papers on ratings, which I have been um, reading and you know, understanding 80% of. So I'm excited to, uh, we've got a lot of great listener questions related to ratings, and I'm excited to welcome our guest to the program, Dr. Mark Glickman. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks for inviting me on your podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super excited. And thanks for all your your contributions to chess over the years. Um, I mean, it's, I'm sure it can be relatively thankless uh, working on these U.S. chess committees. And uh, obviously, our, us chess players love our ratings. So I just wanted, yeah. to, wanted to thank you for that. Oh, yeah. No, my pleasure. Well, <laughs> I'm sure half your listeners are, are going to be disappointed because the rating, you know, the ratings at any point are going to go down. Um, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm glad I, I got involved. I, uh, um, you know, you mentioned I was chair since 1992. I actually got involved in uh, becoming on the ratings committee in 1986 while I was in college. So it's it's been a long run. Wow. Early start. And were you already interested in stats like uh, like consciously at that point? <laughs> Both consciously and unconsciously. <laughs> so yeah, no. In, in 1986 was the year I graduated from college, and I and I was a, a statistics major at uh, at Princeton. In fact, I was the uh, the last person ever to major in in statistics in Princeton because that turned out to be the year that the department uh, folded. Um, hopefully, no uh, no connection to me. <laughs> right. Um, but but I, I was uh, I was actually writing a senior thesis on. Uh, essentially, a, a, a very focused topic uh, having to do with ratings. Essentially, alternative ways to uh, to determine provisional ratings. Um, so that that's actually something that I, I worked on uh, pretty intensely at Princeton, and like that was a time where I was, um, you know, I ended up joining the ratings committee. Okay, yeah, and actually, it came up on a recent episode. Uh, so even listeners newer to chess will might know provisional ratings. Of course, are when you play your first tournament, um, they give you a rating that hasn't stabilized yet. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, uh, what's done is you add four hundred points to an opponent's rating if you beat them, subtract four hundred if you lose, and uh, use the the opponent's rating if you draw, and then just take the average until you've played something like twenty five games. So, Mark, I'm curious what your uh, alternative ideas were. Uh, well, the that that whole procedure um, is is actually very ad hoc, uh, and, and I and I kind of you know I had a sense of that even back uh, when I was in college. So, I mean, basically, what I ended up doing is is something that is probably fairly, uh, you know, fairly natural. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people who uh, do statistical work would, you know, do what I'm about to describe, you know, without even blinking an eye. Um, you know, essentially, the, the idea is that um, you can write out a probability of, um, of the outcome of a game, given the player's ratings, or at least you can, um, you know, come up with reasonable formulas that if, you know, if you and I, if you and I uh, have, ratings that can be supplied, there, there are probabilities that you can write out as formulas that depend on, on the ratings of, of the players. And there's a procedure in statistics, what, which is what's called maximum likelihood estimation. And the basic strategy there is that if, um, if you, uh, if you basically take a data set and you write out a formula that is the formula for the probability of observing the data that you saw, based on, you know, in, in this context, based on, say, unknown ratings, then what you try to do is you try to figure out what must those ratings be 
in order to make that probability of what you saw as as most likely as possible. Hmm. So the so the basic strategy is that you have this formula that um, you know for for the uh, the game outcomes that you saw. You don't know what the ratings are, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to maximize the value of the probability of what you see of, of what you ended up seeing um, as a function of these unknown ratings, and then determining what those unknown ratings are is this uh, this approach called maximum likelihood. Um, and so, you know, most of the thesis kind of uh, um, evolved around that idea of, of determining first ratings for players. And it, it was more, a little more than that, that, but that was, that was the basic, uh, you know, the basic idea underlying, um, you know, what I worked on back then. And how was, uh, do you remember how your paper was received? Did you, did you get an A? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I don't think I, well, I, I graduated, uh, Matt, uh, Kum, Kum, uh, Kum Sula, Kum Sula, what is it? <laughs> I don't even know what it was. Summa cum laude. That's what it is. Yeah. So I, so I think I think I got highest honors uh, in graduating uh, from from Princeton uh, based on my thesis. So I, I guess I guess it was uh, pretty well received. Excellent. They, they, they made me defend it. I mean, I, I don't. This, so something that they don't do very often these days. Um, you know, when you when you write a senior thesis in college, you basically just write the paper, hand it in, and then you know you get some feedback and you know something that. Is like a grade, but in my case, uh, and I guess what they were doing back then is that in addition to just having this written work, you had to get up in front of the entire faculty and prepare a presentation. And um, that almost cured me of not going into academics. <laughs> yeah, I, um, <laughs> I was because that didn't go so well. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I think I was describing things accurately, but um, I was pretty scared to death in lecturing in front of a whole bunch of people that, um, I've never, you know, there were clearly experts in, in statistics and, um, you know, who am I, you know, the senior who, uh, you know, thought about this project for about a year. Um, I don't know. I, it just, it was very uncomfortable and I didn't think it went well and I was ready to kind of turn it in at that, that point And then just, um, you know, instead of going into academics, I'd go into industry, but, um, you know, I ended up deciding uh, the academic route. And now you get to terrorize the students. Exactly. Well, we don't we don't terrorize them by by uh, having them defend their thesis. So okay, it's a li little little uh, we're a little nicer these days. Glad to hear it. And Mark, I did read the the papers that are linked to on your website, which of course I'll share in the 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 show notes um, about ratings. And as mm. I said, understood most of them. Um, and in in the first paper that that you linked to, you sort of gave a bit of historical context about. Uh, how Arpad Elo, who of course is most commonly credited with in inventing the rating system, a uh, Hungarian-American physics professor, didn't actually invent it. Could you could you provide just a bit more context to uh, to listeners who have not yet had the opportunity to to read your work? Well, he it, well, what's kind of interesting is that there there are sort of these parallel worlds that went on. I mean, so Elo. Um, you know, Elo was was essentially developing a uh, an improvement to an existing system that was being used by uh, U.S. Chess Federation, uh, which I believe was the Harkness system. And I, I think what happened is that um, you know this is now back in the the 1950s, and in in the Harkness system, um, the formulas were were super simple, and uh, you know there there were these uh, winning expectancies or you know ex um, you know expected. Uh, game outcomes that could be derived from the ratings that were produced by the, the Harkness system. And they just like, they were completely out of whack. They just didn't make any sense. Um, it was very easy to game the Harkness system. And, you know, Elo, I guess uh, at the time had some interest in, in ratings and he, he basically developed um, a, a system where the main innovation, I, I guess, in, in Elo's system was that the heart, while the Harkness system was using like very simple, um, I'll describe them as linear formulas. What what Elo um, stumbled on uh, was essentially using some of these ideas in uh, certain kinds of probability models that were nonlinear. And and the basic idea um, is that in using these nonlinear systems, he recognized that like you know if you have a rating difference between an, you know between two players that was like a rating difference of like three hundred points. The, the difference in the outcome, if you then expanded the rating difference to, say, 500 points, is not going to be all that much. 
So the actual gain in increasing 200 rating points when you're already 300 points higher than your opponent is not really changing the winning expectancy very much. On the other hand, if you are already, um, you know, say like um, if, if you compare a situation where you're evenly matched with your opponent, you had the same rating, and then you increase the rating by 200 points, that would result in an enormous difference in a winning expectancy. So it actually matters what the rating difference already is when you're comparing increases in ratings to what the impact is on the, the expected outcome of a game. And that comes in the nonlinearity of the formulas. And that's one of the main things that, um, you know, ELO recognized. Now, the, the reason that I said that they're kind of like these parallel worlds is that around the same time, maybe a little bit earlier, there are these, um, these uh, scholars, researchers in statistics. Um, one, uh, the, main, the main person was this guy named Ralph Bradley. And he was working on um, essentially the theory of these um, um, probabilities of game outcome models, much more from a statistical standpoint. And he developed something in collaboration with uh, a um, um, collaborator of his, which eventually became known as what's called the Bradley-Terry model. And the Bradley-Terry model is essentially the winning expectancy formula that ELO used. And that serves as the basis for a lot of uh, a lot of work in statistics that has come since then, including a lot of my own work. But it's interesting to to see that um, you know the Bradley Terry model um, in statistics, which essentially is the same underlying uh, for, set of formulas as uh, the ELO model, um, you know, came about a little bit before ELO. And you know, there's always been at least speculation among people that are kind of in the intersection of chess and statistics, um, whether ELO actually was aware of the work that Bradley and Terry were doing at that time. Um, and, and, but, it, but it's interesting how they're, you know, these, um, you know, kind of parallel um, uh, strands of work that were going on that uh, kind of led to, um, you know, what, what's in, in use today, essentially. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, certainly across history, there's a lot of examples of things being sort of invented parallel, even outside of statistics. But uh, so what's the prevailing theory amongst you, as you say, the intersection of uh, uh, chess rating and statistics aficionados? Do people think that ELO was aware of uh, this other system? It's yeah, I don't know if that's ever been really resolved. I mean, there are a lot of hints that he must have known it uh, just because it seemed a little too coincidental. Um, that you know he came up with you know more or less the same uh, the same form basic formula as what was being used. On the other hand, I mean, I guess I should I should mention that there was this uh, this work that was done about thirty years before then uh, by this um, this mathematician uh, Zermelo, who um, kind of in a, in a very uh, very isolated context actually did develop the same formula. And I think at the time, people were just not generally aware of Zermelo's work. I mean, Zermelo is, is much better known for um, all kinds of crazy things in math. Uh, like you know, he, has, he, he was a huge contributor to, to set theory and, and, and various other things. Zermelo is just really a, a, an amazing mathematician. But um, I, guess he was, I guess he must have been a chess player because he, um, he, he ended up doing this, uh, this little bit of work about how do you estimate um, player strengths in uh, resulting uh, from um, an incomplete round robin uh, tournament, um, and and he, and it has some some really uh, brilliant ideas that um, you know were way ahead ahead of his time. Um, but that paper was forgotten for you know pretty close to thirty years until you know people started thinking about these problems again in the nineteen fifties. And, um, you know, then that paper got rediscovered and there was com some connections there. So I, I guess that to make a long story short, um, it's entirely possible that ELO was not aware of, um, of the work, you know, the sort of the concurrent work by Bradley and Terry, but he was aware of Zermelo's work, which predated him by about 30 years. So, but no one, no one knows for sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah and obviously, um, it's 
you know, stood the test of time, whether it's perfect or not. Uh, Elo is the main prediction engine for 538's sports models. And yeah. apparently it's even been used on Tinder, at least uh, internally, to uh, rank uh, rank people in the dating pool. Although I think they say they don't do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, they actually, so they hired me actually oh, about, about, about 12 years ago. I don't think I'm giving anything away. I, I guess I'm not allowed to say precisely what I did, but they did approach me about how to use, um, you know, the essentially chess ratings to to do matchmaking on Tinder. So I, so actually, a, a graduate student of, of mine and I um, ended up doing some work for them. In, in the end, what I what we actually gave them was something that you know we felt it, like they they wanted to just basically uh, superimpose Elo um, Elo system or you know basically these kinds of systems that are used for um, for uh, rating chess players and just kind of like. Um, superimpose it onto what they're doing. And you know, we were making the point that, um, you know, there, there's actually something a little bit um, more principled you can do because, um, you know, the basic idea is that when somebody is like, you know, swiping left, swiping right, it's the same person. Um, it's not a whole bunch of different people. And, and, and that, and you can actually take advantage of that in a statistical model. So we actually gave them something a little different. And then that, that pretty much ended our, uh, a relationship <laughs> so so uh, may, maybe they were much more interested in just like having um you know something like an elo system uh, just kind of apply directly but we thought we thought there's something you can do a little bit better huh yeah <laughs> fascinating stuff um and mark in your your 1995 paper a comprehensive guide to chess ratings you wrote mm -hmm. uh the introduction of the chess rating system has probably done more to increase the popularity of tournament chess than any other single factor um which I found striking and, you know, maybe Queen's Gambit has changed uh, that now. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, um, yeah, well, I think, I think generally, um, uh, you know, as a, as a marketing tool, uh, you know, ratings have, have a very uh, important uh, role to play, I think in, in competitive chess. Um, I don't think I, I was necessarily the first person to say that. Um, I, I don't remember where I had, I'd read, uh, you know, similar opinions about, uh, ratings really doing more to um, influence the um, participation in, in competitive chess really than more than any other factor. I mean, frankly, um, you know, at, you know, over the years, you know, there, there've been, you know, like one or two events that have just like really inspired people. And, and I think they mostly have to do with, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the coming along of like, you know, truly exceptional players. I mean, the most obvious example in, in my mind is when, you know, Fisher uh, came into prominence in, in the, um, the late sixties, early seventies. And, you know, he, he clearly um, got people inspired in chess, but, and, and, and to some extent I'd say uh, Kasparov uh, had a very similar effect, but um, uh, you know, but kind of as like sort of a long-term um, uh idea i think uh just building ratings into into competitive chess uh you know somehow makes competitive chess a little bit more official it's not just people playing games and winning prizes there's something a little bit more you know at stake and you know something a little bit more uh official about um you know being involved in a in an organization that you know not only governs uh tournament chess but also you know provides you estimates of how strong you are um, you know, using, using some, you know, technology. So I, I, I don't know, I, I stand by that as, um, as, you know, probably, um, you know, one of the biggest factors that, you know, not only encourages people to play, but kind of keeps them involved in, in playing, uh, playing in tournaments. Yeah. And you raise an important point in one of your papers that I hope to explore more later as we sort of talk about, I definitely want to talk about sort of the current rating landscape and the unique circumstances of people coming back from COVID. But you, you mentioned even in your writing long before this, that the rating scale as currently constructed can only be judged relatively relative to the pool of players, not like objective strength. Yeah. It's, well, it's very hard. Um, I know that there, you know, there, there's some work um, in statistics that uh, particularly in sports analytics that have like tried to, you know, bridge, um, you know, bridge abilities uh, and, and um, uh, you know, uh, strengths of, uh, of athletes over time and, and try to, you know, with the uh, intention of trying to make the comparison across eras. It's very hard to do because, um, 
you know, especially in a game like chess, because like chess knowledge um, is just increasing uh, over time anyway. Um, and so if you have a, a pool of players, say like in the 1950s that, you know, know what they know about chess. And then since then, you know, we've just learned so much more about, you know, what constitutes good chess play, you know, then, then there's like this shared knowledge that that's been gained over time. And there's really no way that, um, you know, we can directly measure, you know, what's the impact of, of this uh, increase in shared knowledge, because there's no way to take somebody, you know, currently and have them play against somebody in 1950 to see what's the comparison of what people know. Um, and so that's why I make, you know, that's why I make a point. I, I think it's a, I don't know, I, I think it's a fairly um, self-evident point that, um, you know, you can only judge how strong people are relative to who else is around at the time, because those are the potential uh, competitors that you would be having as opponents. You can't really judge how how well you're, how good you are compared to somebody from, you know, say 50, 70, 100 years ago, because, uh, you know, the, the state of knowledge about chess is changing over time. Right. Although we actually... We have a, a listener question related to um, Dr. Kenneth Regan, who, of course, is one of the leading uh, experts on cheat detection and uh, also statistics professor and international master who's been on the show. Um, and Ken has written a paper about the concept of uh, an, an intrinsic rating, um, where he basically does use engines to compare um you know, the best move to like compare someone's play to the mm -hmm. best move. So I'll just read Tyron Price's question and then maybe you could address this. But I think you also mentioned to me that it might be a question best addressed to, to Ken Regan, who I hope to interview again someday. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Tyron's question is, um, are you familiar with Ken Regan's work on intrinsic rating? If so, what do you think of it? And is there a simple way for a player to estimate their intrinsic rating? He says he tried to follow the math and it's way over his head. Yeah, I, I mean, so I haven't, I mean, I know of it, um, uh, but I, I actually haven't looked at any of the details. I've only, you know, I'm only aware of it in passing because it's very much connected to um, uh, to Ken's work. Um, I, I can certainly comment on the general principle, which is that um, using a chess engine to analyze the quality of moves, um, I think does have some promise. And that that is a way in, in some ways to, be able to, um, you know, bridge the gap to some extent. I mean, now the, the other, um, now the other factor in all this is that, um, you know, we're, we're basically assuming that we're using a chess engine that has the state of knowledge, uh, right now. Um, and the, 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 you know, analyze, you know, it, it's making a very strong assumption that, um, that, um, what we're considering a chess engine uh, to to be um, uh, how how it's actually analyzing uh, how good moves are is is relative to the state of knowledge right now. So if if you if you believe that chess engines basically are invincible and they are finding the absolute best moves, and you know I think they're doing something reasonably close to that at, at this point. Um, you know certainly with enough time, but. Um, you know, there are enough nuances where um, you could sort of argue that the, uh, the, the, the strength that's attached to analyzing individual moves, um, you know, there, there's, there's, enough, there's enough little bits of variation, I think, in, in the choice of moves in how, um, you know, say Stockfish might, you know, the, the program Stockfish might analyze uh, games that um, you can't necessarily I, I think uh, believe that it's always finding uh, the optimal way forward. Um, and, and the way that applies to this argument about being able to measure uh, chess strength going back many years is that, you know, maybe like kind of to first order, it might be doing a reasonable job, but um, I, I think there's enough nuances uh, in, in, uh, you know, chess style that, you know, what it might consider to be optimal moves is not necessarily optimal by like a true objective standard. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you just compare alpha zero and stockfish, like mm -hmm. the top move is going to differ fairly frequently. Exactly. Um, the, the other, the other related issue, and I'll, I'll mention this quickly is that, you know, there's also this presumption that the, um, you know, just simply being able to detect 
or evaluate uh, move by move is uh, essentially solving the problem of being able to rate players. And I think that that's actually the harder problem. And that's actually something that I, I, I've been, that's on my shelf of things that I really want to work on. In other words, I, I very much am planning as like one of my next major projects to be able to come up with a really good uh, rating system that's uh, that depends on move evaluations. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Because I think that is uh, that is really where the future is in being able to understand, um, you know, playing strength. Yeah, and of course, uh, for OTB chess, you know, there there might be some logistics issues in terms of making sure you get all the games and stuff like that. But for online chess, it's easy to imagine a world where it's automated. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I'm my understanding, and and I I can't say uh, you know with 100 percent certainty. You know, but my understanding is that the algorithms to actually measure chess strength and relate them relate them to like even an ELO scale um, is not well developed yet. Um, that, okay. You know, the, I think the jury is out on the, the best way to do that, and and it's a complicated problem because it's not just simply a matter of you know say evaluating each individual um, each individual move, comparing it to um, you know the arguably best move and looking at that difference. And then average, you know, which is what's often called the cent upon loss. And then averaging that difference between what a player moved and what's considered to be the optimal move and averaging that across all the moves that they've played in a game. You can't do that as, as the right strategy because, for example, like in, in I don't know, like in, in um, various parts of the game, um, you know, particularly, you know, say in, in uh, like closed positions um, where, um, you know, the moves are just, you know, very, um, you know, each individual move itself is not going to be very impactful. So you'll have these like long strings of, of moves in a game where, you know, there's really no, ch no real change in, in the, the cent upon loss. And yet it's going to have a very significant impact if you just include each individual move um, in that average. So, so there needs to be some curating of like, which moves are, um, are more relevant than others. And, I think the argument actually is a little more nuanced than that, but that's kind of the basic problem of just simply averaging over every single move in a game. Right. And conversely, if you have like a five point advantage and you play a move that simplifies, but retains a three point advantage, it might mm -hmm. be the, the best move from a human perspective, but the, the engine might dock you if it's not told not to. So exactly. Yeah. Right. And so all those kinds of factors uh, need to be taken into account. And, and I, and I have some thoughts about how to, um, how to have a kind of a nice overarching um, model for how this can be done in a, in a, an appropriate way. But like, I just, I need the, I need data. Yeah. Um, that would be amazing. So yeah, yeah no, I'm looking for, this is going to be a fun project. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this. Great. And, and we've got a lot of topics to hit a lot of uh, listener questions and stuff, Mark, but mm -hmm. what's your sort of big picture view of like, do you feel like the FIDE and the U S chess rating systems are working generally? Um, they're, they're challenging. Um, I, I don't, I generally, well, I, I have, I have a particular bias, which is that, um, that none of these rating systems, uh, outside, outside of the ones that, well, I shouldn't say like all of the ones outside the ones that I've developed. Um, but the ones that are in use in chess for, um, you know, say like UOCF and, and FIDE, which are purely, um, ELO based, they, they don't, they don't, um, account for um, the uncertainty in the in a rating. In other words, you know, when you get, well, let's say like, you know, say that you've, you've played, you know, you've played, played a bunch of tournaments. Um, you've gotten to the point in, in U.S. chess where you've gotten an established rating and then you haven't played for a while after that. And you come back to playing in a tournament and, you know, the way U.S. chess works is that, you know, once rated, always rated, your last rating will be the current rating that you'll be using in your next tournament. And not only that, the formulas going forward based on the results of having returned to play are going to be the same as what they were when you were playing actively. Now, just from a very um, a logical standpoint, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because if, say, you know, a couple of years goes by and, um, you know, you haven't played in, in, um, in competitive chess, you know, we really don't have a very good handle on how strong you are at this point. I mean, you know, you could have, um, you know, for all we know, you could have, um, you know, been 
uh, playing uh, quite a lot and in improving, in which case you're actually much better than your rating um, seems to uh, seems to convey. Or for that matter, you just could have like, uh, you know, dropped chess entirely and stopped playing altogether and then maybe just woke up one morning and decided that you wanted to start playing again. But in that case, your ability is probably much worse than your reported rating. So the, the issue is that, you know, just even, even from the passage of time, um, your, your rating um, that's kept on record you know, it's almost much more like a provisional rating. It, it, it's not really, um, you know, a, a, a measure of your ability that uh, you can really trust. And so the, the kinds of rating systems that I've developed really are, are designed to tackle that particular issue. It's being able to quantify how reliable a rating actually is. Um, so both ELO and, um, I mean, well, e the ELO rating in particular is a, a rating system that doesn't have any kind of rating uncertainty quantification attached to it. And, and I think that's, uh, that just uh, creates all kinds of, uh, all kinds of problems. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, they, they I mean, the, I, I could just like rattle off a, a list of problems that that's a consequence of, of, um, you know, not incorporating uncertainty. I mean, I just, one, one just very quickly is that um, I think for the longest time, people have been attached to the idea uh, and they thought this was actually a great feature of the ELO system that, you know, when your when your rating goes up by a certain amount, your opponent's rating goes down by the same amount. And so, you know, like the rating points are essentially conserved in a rating pool um, by having a system that way. But if you think about it a little bit, that's just it's it's a really absurd idea to have uh, have a system require that you know, the, your, your rating, um, that, that rating points are conserved as a result of a game. And, you know, the simplest kind of example of, of why that would be a problem is that, you know, if I'm, if I'm somebody who, um, you know, has a very unreliable rating and like, you know, I can measure that it's unreliable and you're somebody who, you know, say plays chess all the time. And so your rating is, is very stable and very believable and reliable then, you know, suppose that I defeat you in a game. Well, if I defeat you in a game, it probably isn't really saying very much about how strong you are because, for one thing, you know, we don't really know how good I am at this point because I'm, I have a very unreliable rating. Um, and so the fact that I defeated you doesn't really say anything much about how strong you are. So your rating shouldn't change very much as a result of our game. Meanwhile, the fact that I defeated you you being a very reliably rated player should actually have a, an enormous impact on my rating. Like my rating should go up a lot, um, you know, relative to, um, you know, relative to yours going down because like we've learned something really informative about how strong I am. So I would say that that's a, a very clear example where the, the rating exchange would, would not be even like my rating should go up a lot and yours should go down like barely, any amount, if at all. Um, and, and I think that's like a, you know, a good example of, of where, you know, the ELO system and, and FIDE in particular kind of uh, have some uh, challenges. I mean, they, they do some things that address that issue, but they're, they're not all that principled, I think. Yeah. And of course, these issues are exacerbated here in the online age where everyone, like the opportunities to improve away from the tournament hall are greater than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and so you mentioned that you've devised a system that you feel like is more responsive to sort of uh, recent data and can fluctuate more if someone's out of practice. And of course, that's sort of the the, the foundation of your your Glico system that that Leachess and Chess dot com use. And we right. have a question from a, an anonymous uh, cognitive scientist and friend of the podcast who invented the name Glico system. <laughs> I think I think the per I think the the person who uh, asked the question actually <laughs> invented the name. Um, yeah. So uh, you're referring, of course, to Chris Chabri, a good friend of mine. Um, so yeah. So he he was my uh, he was my um, informal agent at the time. Um, I, so I, 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 if I recall at the time when I, when I, I mean, the, well, the, the origin of all, all of this was, uh, that I was in, like when, when I, when I developed this system, so I, I developed the system around, um, 1994, 1995. And, um, like somehow, uh, I don't remember the exact details 
of of this aspect of it. But um, I, I was somehow I, I was I was on um, I was playing on on FICS, the Free Internet Chess Server, and I somehow got into a discussion with uh, the admins on this on that system. And I, I might have just like mentioned to them that oh I you know I've um, you know I've come up with this uh, you know new rating algorithm that you know one of the features of the algorithm is that it would actually um, you know quantify uh, what players' uncertainty is and their their ratings and and you know that players when they play a lot then the rating the rating changes wouldn't uh, wouldn't be as high in magnitude over time. And then if players were, you know, not playing for a while, then those rating changes would increase. And, and I think they liked the idea and then they ended up implementing it. And, and you know, that's kind of how um, the, Gl the Glico system kind of caught on. You know, meanwhile, you know, I was, I was um, you know, I was, uh, you know, Chris was a good friend and, you know, I was telling him all about the rating system. And, um, you know, I, I think at the time I was thinking, oh, I, maybe I should call the system the GLO system. You know, having it be a direct uh, connection to Elo, and um, eventually, um, Chris convinced me that uh, it would be better uh, to call it Glico uh, to have a, a more overt connection to my name. Um, so I, you know, I, I trust I, I've trusted his uh, judgment about these things, and I still trust him now. And so I ended up, uh, you know, going with Glico, and, and so there it is. And, and I have to say, <laughs> I have to say that uh, it, it's it's I've had some interesting experiences. I, I, I'll mention this. Um, I went to this uh, conference a couple of years ago in uh, Rio de Janeiro. It was a statistics conference. And um, the way the conference was set up is that like we were all in, in this hotel. And then in order to get to the conference center, we had to take a bus uh, to get there. And, and so I was kind of standing around waiting for the bus. And there was, you know, a bunch of other statisticians there. So you can imagine what a good time that was. <laughs> um and so, like, I was talking to this one guy, um, and I, you know, discovered he he was um, he's actually a very famous statistician. I didn't recognize him by face, but you know, I was talking to him, um, and you know, he asks me, um, you know, he, he asked me, uh, you know, my name. I mentioned, you know, I mentioned I'm Mark Lickman, and he like he, his eyes his eyes bug out, and he said, "You're the Glico guy. You're famous." <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that that was uh, you know, hearing that from from somebody who. Um, you know, it was a, a huge name in, in the statistics world was actually, uh, you know, quite, quite rewarding in a way. So, yeah, of course. I, I, so I think, I think of uh, Chris uh, when, when those sorts of things happen. Yeah. It, and it is a good name. So, uh, so shout out to Christopher Shabri as yeah, always. Thanks, um, thanks Chris. Yeah. Um, so we've got to take a break and hear from our sponsors, Mark, and then we're going to dive into some listener questions. Sounds great. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by AimChess.com. AimChess, of course, collects your games from the major chess sites and then gives you an actionable study plan. So it's a great resource for players and coaches alike. It tells you how you compare it to your rating peers in openings, end games, time management, all that stuff. It told me I was behind on the clock in 87% of my recent Blitz games. I think I might need to work on that. And thanks to AimChess for pointing that out. But it's a great product. Go to AimChess and check it out. And if you decide to try out a subscription, use the code PERPETUAL30 to save 30%. As always, the info you need is also in the show notes. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by our longtime sponsors, our original sponsors, Chessable.com. Chessable, of course, is known for its proprietary move trainer technology, which utilizes space repetition to help you remember openings, tactical patterns, whatever it is that you're working on. They have a huge library of courses, including the free short and sweet versions of various openings. Speaking of openings, they just dropped Lifetime Repertoires, The London System by Grandmaster Lequang Liam. Love or hate the London, you got to know what to do against it. So be sure to take a look for that. And don't forget to sub to the How To Chess podcast hosted by yours truly. We just had Peter Fiddler on, other big guests in the works. So all the links you need are in the show description. Let's get back. Back to talking chess. And we are back and we've got a bunch of questions to bang out. So let's just dive right in. Of course, uh, supporters of Perpetual Chess are able to find out the guests. And um, I was happy to, to get some great questions for, uh, for Dr. Glickman. So question number one, I think, sort of sets the stage. It's from Ali Campbell. And Ali asks, he says, I had a question about ratings for Dr. Glickman. If someone's rating increases from 1,000 to 2,000 over 10 years, one explanation would be that their playing strength increased by 100 points each year. 
But another is that their strength was always 2000 and it just took 10 years for their rating to catch up. How can you tell which of these possibilities is true? Are GMs born at 2500 strength and their improvement is illusory? Or do they actually get stronger over the course of their life? Well, all right. So let me let me answer the question this way. If um, if this player was truly, uh, say, 2500 strength, and somehow um, by some quirk of the rating system, their initial rating was um, was somehow assigned to be 1,000 uh, or 1,200, you know, whatever, some low rating, then it would be very hard from the rating system to distinguish the two kinds of situations that Ali is talking about. Because, um, you know, there's, there, you know, in, in either case, um, you know, the player is going to be improving over time or, or the rating is going to be uh, changing over time and in, increasing in, in this, um, you know, this approach of it going up about 100 points a year, say. Um, so there's no way to tell. But the, the safeguard in the rating system really is that um, it, it should you know, assuming that, um, you know, for example, that the player, you know, didn't, you know, throw his games on, on the first time that they've played. And I know that players sometimes do that. Um, but assuming that that um, this player was truly 2,500 strength when they first started, and then they had, um, uh, you know, a, a rating that was uh, calculated for them based on their initial performance, there's no way in the world that their rating would have been, would have started out at, at 1,200. Um, so, so I, I can, you know, I could certainly, um, you know, say with, with, uh, some amount of, uh, assuredness that, um, that a, a player of 2,500 strength, unless they're purposely losing games to get a low first rating would not end up being in a situation where their first rating was like 1000 and that they would have to catch up. Yeah. I guess there could be less extreme examples, but other, other than that, yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, I guess the, the whole scene setting thing is it's like deliberately establishing a lower rating. I guess there's greater risk than ever now because of, uh, again, because of online play, um, right. it, it used to be, no one would show up as a, you know, even a 20 to 2300, no one shows up fully formed, but, yeah. but these days I've interviewed people who are at or close to that strength who've, you know, barely set foot in a tournament hall. So. Um, yeah, we so you know some of the work that was uh, that's been done for um, U.S. chess uh, for for the rating system has been uh, to suggest you know mechanisms to identify these kinds of behaviors. And what we've always been suggesting is uh, to construct um, you know some kind of um, uh, audit system that would be more based on things like uh, like essentially a performance rating ca calculation. So like the, the most, like the simplest thing that could be implemented for um, say you, you know, us chess federation would be something like look at players um, performance ratings across the tournaments that they're playing and see what their performance rating, how their performance ratings, um, how they differ from uh, you know, their performances in you know money events versus say like I don't know like weekend quads or something, um, and you know if if there's some evidence that players are playing um, you know substantially worse, I mean not you know like I mean there's a way to to quantify like what's you know what's kind of worse but like within you know sort of normal variation and then there's like worse where you're you know using losing to players that are much much lower rated than you. Um, if you can find examples of patterns where, um, you know, players are performing exceedingly well at uh, tournaments where there's, you know, serious money prizes and, um, and events where there's essentially no money prizes or very low entry fees and players are just performing terribly, then you can identify, uh, you know, instances of fraudulent behavior um, just purely from, you know, from game outcomes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure, sure um, Ken Regan would have something to say about that from the standpoint of actually lo looking at the moves. But you could even more coarsely um, evaluate it just based on, on um, you know, performances with uh, the players ratings involved. Yeah, but, yeah, that's it's, it's a good point and probably will be needed. Uh, yeah, and, I, and it's yeah, it's a little disappointing that, um, at least, you know, I, I've worked with U.S. chess for, you know, forever. Um, I, I don't know if they've actually implemented something like that. I think they have some very 
kind of crude after the fact version, but it seems like it's it's about time um, to automate this process and just have it be uh, kind of like running, um, you know, kind of running in perpetuity. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure that's not happening, um, but it would be nice if it were. Yeah. Yeah. I know they've got a lot on their plate, but yeah, sure. sooner, I mean, Gorchberg or someone like that could take it on as well. Um, the yeah. Big tournament organizer here in the U S right. Cause uh, it, it exactly benefit, you know, th that kind of a system would exactly benefit. Um, but, but I think even with Gorchberg and, and, um, you know, continental chess, like, they might even have their own, you know, internal, uh, system where, where they track players that are working, you know, within uh, that are playing in continental chess, um, events and i think they they might even just sort of do some of the work themselves but it but it needs to be uh, you know upscaled to you know national organizations yeah. yeah um cool okay and the next question is from mark wilkins and uh mark asks he says the last 25 years i've seen extremely quick progress in the in the development of statistical rating system particularly due to the needs of real-time matchmaking for video games what do you think the best opportunities are for over the board chess world to learn from these innovations? And what's your sense of how receptive the key players like FIDE, USCF, and other federations are to these changes? Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say that, um, you know, I, like I, I've, you know, my, again, my involvement in US chess has, uh, you know, it's been around since, uh, you know, the 80s and 90s. And, you know, along the way, I, you know, I've been, suggesting all kinds of changes to the rating system that are, you know, fairly technical. And these are the sorts of things that, you know, probably players wouldn't be able to, um, you know, to perform the calculations on their own, although, you know, they can certainly apply, you know, approximations to those calculations. But, but I've been struck really over the years, how uh, little appetite, um, you know, the, the boards of, uh, you know, the executive boards of us chess have been in particular for, you know, making these uh, more technical changes. And I, 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 at one level, I understand their attitude because, you know, their feeling is that, um, you know, players derive certain satisfaction at being able to, you know, recompute their own ratings. And that's, you know, pretty much been, uh, you know, true for as long as I've been involved. Um, but on the other hand, um, that you're not getting a lot of accuracy uh, with, um, you know, with these, these rating systems that, you know, are not, um, you know, as, as uh, you know, technically principled as they could be. Um, so my, my overall feeling is that US, UCF and FIDE, uh, which is FIDE systems these days even simpler than, than USCF. Um, I, I mean, these systems could really benefit a lot from having, uh, you know, using some of the kinds of um, systems that are being used online. I mean, just one example is there is, you know, for, for a lot of the Microsoft um, online gaming, there is this rating system called TrueSkill, uh, which actually turns out to be like um, very closely related to my Glico system, but also applies to, um, you know, multiple uh, competitors, uh, not just head-to-head -head games. But, um, you know, these kinds of systems um, tend to, uh, you know, be use, use pretty rigorous methods that uh, go beyond, um, you know, what Elo uh, and, and Bradley and Terry uh, worked on. And, and they're, you know, much, uh, you know, they're much more applicable um, and more reliable than, you know, what we're seeing that's uh, being implemented for over-the-board chess. Um, so I think there's a lot to learn. Uh, and, I, and I really wish that some of these organizations would, um, you know, realize that, you know, we're, we're in a day now where uh, it doesn't matter anymore for players to be able to compute their own ratings on a piece of paper. That's just not really where we are these days. And so it shouldn't be really holding back, uh, you know, developing a, a rating system that can be implemented um, for use in, in USCF or FIDE. Um, that's like, you know, as technically sophisticated as it needs to be in order to get accurate ratings for players. So yeah. There, yeah. Hearing you talk about it takes me back to having like a handheld table where like after you play someone, you can check, okay, they're 300 points higher rated than me and I won. So that means, you know, I gained 24 points or whatever it exactly. is. Exactly. Like eagerly check the table. Yeah, You don't really need to do that anymore. So No, no. And even even with just, uh, I mean, I, I guess, uh, you know, the US, USCF administrators probably thought that when we moved over from that tabular output into just a formula, 
with the winning expectancy having an exponential in that formula, they maybe they thought that that was the limit. And, you know, anything more complicated than that would be problematic. And of course, like, you know, now we're, you know, we're living in a world where, you know, iterative computing is, uh, is like pretty much necessary to do anything serious. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. And, um, yeah, hopefully I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I mean, given how much, um, online chess, um, and a lot of these uh, online organizations are popping up, um, and drawing people away from over the board chess, hopefully, uh, you know, and entities like uh, USCF and FIDE are going to wise up and, um, you know, be a little more serious about the kinds of rating systems that uh, should be implemented. Yeah. Um, and I, in looking through the the listener questions, um, I see that uh, Alex Friedman had, had asked a question about the feasibility of adopting a Glico-like system. I think uh, we've, we've pretty much covered that. And Michael Spisner had asked about uh, an objective system based on average centipon loss, which I think yeah, I would love. Yeah, I would love that. I mean, <laughs> again, again, it's it's not um, it's not going to be quite as simple as just simply averaging uh, the centipon loss across games. Um, it, it it's much more involved than that. But I think the core idea of having um, a, a strong chess engine evaluate moves is is has a lot of promise. Um, yeah. because you wouldn't, you wouldn't need that many games to get an accurate rating, presumably. Right. Yeah. More inputs. Yeah. That makes exactly. sense. Um, cool. And so you mentioned you've been a little disappointed with uh, USCF not being sort of, um, super responsive. Have you had any interactions with FIDE or other federations about p potential changes? Not directly. Um, I mean, I've been, I've been kind of aware of what's been going on and I've been in conversations where I think they were, they were thinking about Glico. Um, and then I, I guess somehow it, it just, um, it, you know, it, it didn't, it didn't get to the point where they were, uh, you know, serious enough that they wanted to, um, go with it. But, um, but I think they've, I, I, for reasons I, I don't, you know, I, I haven't been involved in these discussions, so I don't know exactly, um, what the rationale is, but they, I think they decided pretty much to kind of stick with their current system and make tweaks as, as needed. Um, okay. but, but, you know, but that's, um, uh, you know the customer base for uh, for FIDE are, is is a you know a, a, a large group of chess players that you know are not necessarily looking to uh, necessarily have a very sophisticated rating algorithms. So I mean, from I suppose from that lens, it's uh, you know it's understandable what's going on. But um, at some point, you know all all of these um, different tweaks that are being made to the rating system are just not going to hold it together anymore and probably would need to reboot it. And then, you know, at that point, maybe they'll start looking for, um, you know, people who have thought about these kind of problems um, in, in a much more sophisticated way, especially the people that have been working with online systems. Um, and then, you know, they'll, they'll get a, a more reliable type of uh, rating system. That, yeah, that, that would be welcome. Um, so I've just got a few more topics to, to hit Mark, sure. but first sure, I want to good. take uh, one more break and hear from our sponsors. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by Chess.com, up and coming chess site, name to watch in the space. Jokes aside, of course, Chess.com has entertaining Twitch streamers and Puzzle Rush is always fun, even if I'm bad at it. But it also has great uh, educational materials. I, I'm a big fan of the drills to help you convert uh, material advantage against those super strong bots. Obviously, the game reports after every game are indispensable. Even when they're telling you that you played badly, you got to do it and learn from it. And of course, I've advocated in the past for the vision trainer, especially if you're trying to learn the coordinates so that you can read the chess books that we talk about, or if you just want to get faster with it, it's a great way to learn. So I think you know what URL to go to. Just be sure to take advantage of all the tools that chess.com has to offer. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. ChessMood is a subscription-based instructional website founded by Grandmaster Avtek Gregorian, who you can hear on episode 192 of Perpetual Chess. Founded by Avtek and his team of Grandmasters, there's a huge library of opening middle game and end game videos. There's special events like webinars, streams, one-on-one -on -one blitz games. Every Chess Mood member gets a consultation call with one of the... Uh, 
Grandmaster Coaches. And also be sure to check out Chess Mood's free content. Avtech has a great blog. They also have a YouTube channel where they're posting videos from Grandmasters daily. So links you need are in the show description, but be sure to check out chessmood.com. And we are back. So, Mark, um, one other sort of big topic that I, of course, wanted to discuss is the idea of uh, rating deflation, which uh, has come up sort of anecdotally. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's been my experience um, having played tournament chess for some 30 years that I certainly feel like, uh, you know, a a 2100 today is stronger than one of 30 years ago and and so on down. Um, And of course, it's an especially acute issue uh, coming out of the pandemic, I, um, you know, a lot, of, it's come up a lot on the podcast, how obviously uh, kids tend to improve faster and they can improve even without playing tournaments. So um, we're in a unique moment where kids are always known to be underrated. Um, and now that can be exacerbated. But in reading your work, one thing that I hadn't come across was sort of the the more broad deflationary tendency of the ELO system. So mm-hmm. to sort of set the stage, could you could you describe uh, what you what you wrote about there? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, the the basic uh, problem again with these rating systems is, uh, you know, the the ones that don't really capture the uncertainty of a rating, and that's to a large extent what um, what some of the problem is. Um, you know, it, it, with a system like the ELO system, um, you know, if if uh, you know your 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 rating is your rating is always assumed to be um, reliable, or you know, kind of equally reliable regardless of um, how old you are, um, how frequently you're playing, um, whether there's any evidence that you're improving over time. Uh, none of these factors is uh, is incorporated into uh, into the ELO system. So, you know, if you're you know if you're um, like an adult player who's fairly stable. And versus, um, you know, a uh, like a scholastic player who is just improving very quickly, even if they if the two players are starting out having the same rating, the rating changes are always going to be the same. So that if a player, uh, if, if a scholastic player is improving very, very quickly, the rating is going to lag behind. So that's essentially the, the mechanism by which uh, ratings tend to deflate. It's not it's not. Um, a, a necessary proposition that a rating system has to have deflation, but if you're not careful about how a rating system is, uh, what the formulas are and how it's set up, which is, you know, the ELO system is, is an example of, then you're going to have a, a problem where, um, where, where these, you have these players that are improving much more quickly than their ratings are tracking and so you'll get to a point where, like, say, the scholastic player has uh, a rating of, say, seventeen hundred, but in fact they're like of like two thousand strength. And then what's going to happen is that they're going to be playing opponents that are, you know, maybe rated appropriately, but the results of games between this underrated, um, this underrated scholastic player and an appropriate related uh, rated opponent those kinds of games are going to go in favor more often of the scholastic player relative to the rating. And that's going to essentially bring the ratings down Um, because the scholastic player, the scholastic player is going to basically have these, what would seem to be, you know, unusual, unusually good results relative to his rating. And so their opponent's ratings are going to start going down. So the source of the deflation are uh, players who are relatively stable, but they're playing against underrated opponents, like typically scholastic players. Right. And yeah. and you point out that a key point, I think, is that a lot of older players are leaving the pool. So they they keep their rating. You know, maybe they would go down if they if they kept playing, but uh older established ratings leave the pool and then young skilled players enter the pool mm-hmm. and need to get the rate are gonna get the rating points from somewhere. Right. Well, right. Well, the, well, well, again, and that's a feature of ELO. It's not a feature of like all rating systems. So right. like, like, for example, uh, you know, a, a, ba- a basic type of fix to this problem is um, to recognize that when, um, when players are, um, you know, having their ratings move uh, pretty rapidly upward, you could basically um, have a trigger in the system where when, 
when the players are, are just performing so much better than the rating, then the magnitude of the moves beyond that are going to be bigger. So for example, say you have a, a player who's 1500 rating, but you know, it's pretty clear based on their performances that, you know, they're, they're playing like a, you know, an 1800, 1900 player because they're just defeating opponents left and right that are much higher rated than they are. And so in that kind of a situation, you would end up, um, you know, a fix to this kind of problem that's very principled would be to say that once a player is identified as um, playing much better than their rating, what you could do is you can make their, um, you know, like their K factor in the, in the rating formula or just, you know, whatever the magnitude of change is going to be as a result of the next uh, tournament that they play in is going to be much bigger. So when they play in their next tournament, it's not going to be like just adding a handful of rating points anymore when they have a good performance. You're going to end up adding a large amount of rating points. And, yeah. so, and so you'll be able to actually track their uh, improvement much better. And, and that's, by, by the way, that's something that um, the Glico 2 system directly addresses. Um, because the, the Glico 2 rating system that I, uh, that I developed is specifically designed to um, to track players that have sudden bursts in performance, and then it essentially um, makes their um, you know it makes their rating so uncertain that um, that it has the ability to actually move much more quickly beyond that. Um, and so I, I think that's an important uh, feature of a of a system to be able to build in if you know that there's deflation uh, currently going mm-hmm. on. I'm sold, Mark. Where do I sign up for the Glico system? <laughs> yeah, luckily, well, luckily, you know, I tried to actually patent uh, the Glico 2 system, and it was provisionally patented for a year, but then it wasn't marketed very well. And so I basically went and, of course, let it go into the public domain. So you can sign up anywhere you like uh, and just like use the system, and uh, it's all yours. Excellent. Um, and just a, a little more color from uh, Ken Regan again. He wrote a blog post on July 30th where he looked at um, he looked at the the intrinsic uh, move quality again, comparing to engines of the U.S. Championship and you know the U.S. Women's Championship and the U.S. Junior Championship. So he was sort of able to uh, begin to parse data about sort of the effect of. Um, of the pandemic on different demographics Mm. and uh, definitely recommend listeners check out that post. And then he wrote a little comment at the end that looked at more data that uh, that's happened in subsequent months. But uh, in conclusion, Ken wrote, but I've certainly demonstrated the obvious that the current official ratings of almost all the keenest young players are very wrong. And Mm. of course, as we record this, um, you know, 18 year old, uh, Carissa Yip just like ran roughshod through the U.S. Yeah. Women's Championship, yeah. um, which could be uh, yet another example. Um, and of course, you were out in front of this in your writing. You highlighted also the possibility of regional and countrywide issues with ratings, where if oh, people sure. aren't traveling that much, um, different ratings can mean different things in different places. And again, anecdotally, but people always say that FIDE ratings of uh, Indian players are, uh, are preposterously underrated. So. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah a, lot, a lot of potential fixes. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to just say, yeah, that, that sort of thing happens, especially when, you know, the, the pool of players that compete against each other are not mixing at all. And then again, it's the same issue that um, if that pool of players just seems to be um, getting better on average than some other pool of players over time, there's really no way to, for the rating system to pick that up. So the only yeah. way, except for, you know, I mean, now, you know, thanks to Ken and others, um, using a chess engine to evaluate uh, actual moves and then somehow convert that into uh, chess strength. Um, yeah, so lots of uh, lots of issues. And yeah, um, thank you for, for helping highlight them. Um, if you're up for it, Mark, I'd like to just talk about your sort of life in chess a bit sure. before we let you go. Are you okay on time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. So you made it to USCF Master. So were you, were you playing as a, a teen? What's your, what's your your chess story? Yeah, I mean, so I, I started playing. So I, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, I mostly was playing in uh, local events um, when I was uh, growing up. So playing lots of uh, lots of quads, um, you know, occasional um, you know weekend Swisses, um, and, and you know, so I, I most of my active years were in high school and college. And I was, um, you know, I got to the point of being um, an expert, like in, um, you know, mid to high 2100s 
uh, coming out of college. And then I, I for, for various uh, reasons that I won't elaborate on, I decided to take a year gap between um, uh, college and graduate school. And I decided uh, that year to um, at least uh, for a while to really um, you know, focus a lot on on getting better at chess and playing more actively, and that was the year that I ended up becoming um, a master. Um, and you know, I I really did um, uh, I, I did really uh, put a lot of effort into um, into becoming uh, better and and did a lot of studying and you know as, as much as one could do in 1986 and 1987. And then um, you know, I, I pretty much uh, from that point onward, once I started graduate school. Um, I, I, I wasn't playing nearly as actively. I, I played in, you know, occasional events in the Boston area um, where, you know, because I, I ended up coming here to go to uh, grad school. Um, and and uh, pretty much I, my activities sort of trailed off a little bit. I, I was playing in the U.S. Amateur Team East pretty regularly from year to year. And I, I pretty much kept that up until um, the early 2000s. And then that was pretty much the last time I played in, um, in competitive chess. Um, other than playing online, but like, I'm, I'm definitely, I want to, at some point, uh, start playing actively again. I think once, once life starts to, um, you know, sort of take it easy a little bit on me. You, know, you gotta, uh, you gotta do the in. intrinsic grading paper first, Mark. No, no <laughs> okay. tournaments before that. Perfect. Um, Good idea. <laughs> um, so any, fa- any particular books that, that you feel like made a big difference for your chess? Books that mean difference for me i'm gonna i'm gonna turn around right now and look at my bookshelf to see what what sort of jumped out at me um oh, i don't know um okay well we can keep yeah. it going and you can come back to it if you think of anything i know it's been a while and yeah I mean, I, I mean i actually i i i you know some of the end game uh composition books were oh, actually cool. been kind of fun like so um, the, this, uh, a Troitsky book is good. I have this, uh, uh, this, this German book of, 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 um, of in, in game compositions. And I, I, I don't remember, I think Herbst, Herbstman might've written it. I forget, but yeah, so some of those have been really a lot of fun. I, I, yeah, I, I very much work. enjoyed end game compositions. Cool. And do you play any online? Do you play any blitz? Um, I haven't lately. I, I think, uh, I, 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 the last time I played was a couple of years ago and I think I it got to the point where I was, uh, screaming enough at the computer that <laughs> I, I, I felt it might be a little, and also my, my, my wrist, I think uh, was starting to get affected a little bit. Um, but, um, no, I, I, I enjoy it, but like it's, uh, playing blitz online. I, I make too many mistakes and I get down on myself a little bit too much. Sounds um, all too familiar. Yeah. And yeah, it I'm, takes, I'm sure it takes... most people have that experience, but, um, yeah. I, I don't yeah, know how like... much screaming is involved with most, <laughs> most players. You're, you're not the first that's for sure. Yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what about following top level chess? Do you, do you keep up with it at all? Um, a little bit, not, not really as much as I'd like to. Um, but you know, but I, I keep, I keep in touch, I kind of keep on top of sort of the main things that are going on. Okay. And I know that, uh, the aforementioned Christopher Chabri has lots of stories from sort of, uh, brushes with chess legends who who (laughs) came to Harvard when he was there. Do you, do you have any similar or overlapping stories? Um, like Karpov and Kasparov, Simos, and meeting Anand through Patrick Wolf and all, all these stories. Um, yeah, I mean, I well, um, I mean, I guess. Uh, I, so, uh, it, I, I guess I will mention this. So, in, in the year between um, uh, the year between uh, college and graduate school, I, I dated a top uh, female chess player uh, who was pretty well connected. And like that year, uh, so part of the reason I got to be more serious about chess is I, I actually did get to uh, meet a whole bunch of top players that year um, through her. Um, and that was actually, um, that, that was kind of a, a neat thing because, uh, you know, to the extent that I was like maybe a little bit, you know, like I, I read about all these players, I never really met them. You know, it started off as like a little bit of a starstruck experience, but then, you know, I got to know all these people and it, it actually was uh, quite a lot of fun. Um so I don't know. That's like that's been my my big uh, brush with fame, I suppose. And I, I get the sense you don't want to re- reveal the 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 player you think. Yeah, well, but... yeah. I think yeah. Maybe it'd be better if I I didn't. Yeah, I didn't go okay. into it because I don't want to get any repercussions. I mean, it's all fine, but like I right. I yeah, I don't, I I don't want to start and... dragging in that person. 
are any of the encounters particularly memorable, the people that you met from these experiences? Um, not really. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose one of the more memorable experiences that I've had was actually involved involved Chris Chabri because um, back in 1992, um, you know, there there was this uh, uh, Karpov uh, simul that that went on in France where uh, Karpov ended up playing uh, teams of four players that were at different universities, and the the way that the simul was done was that the four players could collude and. Um, decide on on their moves together, and I, I guess as uh, as um, an example of like teleconferencing or video conferencing, back in 1992, they decided to um, bring in a team from um, from jointly from MIT and Harvard, and so we basically put together um, the, these uh, couple of friends of mine at MIT, and and I got together. And we were actually one of the teams that were uh, asked to uh, play against uh, Karpov in this um, this video conference event. And so the way that uh, Chris was involved, I think Chris was involved somehow in in the logistics of uh, running the event. But um, more particularly, he was the person who was making Karpov's moves for us. Uh, so like basically, we were in a room, um, and Chris was sitting on Karpov's side of the board, and then we were, um, you know colluding, trying to decide on our moves, and then would make the move on the board, and then Chris would uh, make the move back. And I, I have to say, I, one of the memorable things about that, um, aside from uh, getting uh, destroyed pretty quickly by Karpov, <laughs> was that there, were, there would be times where, you know, we would we would all be sitting there waiting for, um, for Chris to move, and uh, as it turned out, the move was already made, and we just didn't notice it. And, and Chris always like looked at us in a kind of a puzzled way uh, <laughs> about, um, you know, when, when we were going to actually like realize that it was our, you know, it was our turn. Um, so that, that was a little embarrassing, but uh, it still, it was quite a lot of fun. And it was a, ni- a fun experience playing against Karpov while he was in Paris and we were uh, in Cambridge. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, and just uh, one more sort of, question I wanted to, to hit on, Mark, is I saw that you founded a uh, sports analytics laboratory. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was curious if you can think of any sort of applications of big data, the data revolution that, that could be applied to chess that you're that you're not seeing take place right now, aside from all our rating conversations. Uh, you know, usually the question that ends up getting asked is actually the reverse. So it's interesting you you ask. Huh. Uh, in, in other words, like what yeah, can we? Of engines, I guess. Well, what well what can we learn about uh, rating chess players that can be applied to uh, to sports? Um, because like I like I I have some contract work with the U.S. Olympic Committee where I'm actually helping them uh, like rate athletes in in different sports uh, and to be able to to estimate how good they are and how likely they are to. Uh, win various events, even outside the Olympics. Um, but, you, you know, the kind of, it, it's hard to think of the the reverse direction, namely, um, you know, playing ideas from sports to chess, because a lot of the work that goes on in sports analytics these days is using, um, using like, for example, player tracking data, like looking at the locations of players on a field and then seeing what their movements are like, especially in conjunction with other teammates. And then, you know, being able to kind of like learn what sort of um, strategies work, what don't work. I guess the the closest thing really uh, to those kinds of, um, uh, th- those kinds of tasks is really um, using chess engines to be able to evaluate individual positions and being able to assess ability and, and you know, learn something about strategy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's hard to think of, hard to think of examples that are just like really directly, um, related, you know, that could be applied that, that are being used in, in sports analytics, um, that can be used in, in, uh, um, in chess because, okay. because I, I know my, my experience is that it, it's been much more common to go the other direction. Um, and mm-hmm. a lot of, and a lot of the stuff that I do in sports analytics actually is, like taking ideas from what's been done in rating chess players and seeing, you know, what might apply to, um, you know, rating athletes and, and examining career trajectories over time. 
Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that chess is uh, not behind in, in that regard. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we, we've covered all the topics I wanted, Mark. I mean, I do feel like you've helped highlight some some serious problems in the rating system. I mean, you know, um, and honestly, it sounds like the, the Glico, your systems or similar systems could could solve a lot of them. So um, how do we make it happen? What do you think? Do we start a petition or what? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, if, I, if I had the answer, I suppose uh, the U.S. Chess Federation rating system, uh, you know, for the last 20 years would have been something that looks a lot more like Glico. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the right person since I'm not, you know, I don't have the, the right marketing skills, but I don't know. I mean, there, I, I have to say there, there is a move right now um, to, to try to get, um, uh, try to get like uh, rating uh, uncertainty attached to USCF ratings. So that, that's been something that uh, came up a few years ago. Um, and, you know, the, the executive board was actually interested in, coming up with a measure of, um, of like rating reliability, uh, because I think they, they started seeing the light and then it, it's now a couple years later, I think there's still interest in that direction, but my understanding is that their level of interest is more, um, as a way of just simply, um, quantifying the uncertainty, whereas like something in Glico actually takes that measure and builds it into the rating updates, which mm -hmm. it doesn't sound like, um, USCF is quite ready to do. So I don't know. I mean, like they're, they're sort of inching forward, I suppose. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what it's going to take to, to get there. Um, yeah. And I agree with you about USCF, but FIDE changes would be welcome as well, to be clear. Mm. And, and I did think of one more thing. Sorry. Sure. Oh, yeah, I hope yeah. it's okay. I, I don't know how up you are on sort of the online rating systems, but lately it's becoming more of an issue to sort of translate ratings because chess.com ratings might have like a mild upward skew compared to FIDE and USCF, but then FIDE, I mean, uh, Leachess has incorporated a system, which I think was as the system was originally intended, where you keep 1500 as either, I think it's the mean or the median rating. Mm, okay. And because of that, it, it, it pushes up the whole scale. Right. Um, and it just results into like all kinds of, uh, I mean, I understand the the reasons for each place doing it, yeah. but it, it causes confusion because you always have to specify and then try to translate. So do you think there's any hope of like a, a universal <laughs> rating system that like incorporates online identity and live identity and uh, makes things less confusing? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm skeptical uh, something like that would ever happen just because, uh, you know, everybody is kind of working uh, separately. But I can imagine that there might be, um, you know, a, uh, you know, a service that might be able to figure out um, how to translate from one system to the next, because all that really is required is you just need to have a whole bunch of people and their current ratings on these different systems. And then you can develop a statistical, um, you know, conversion process that will tell you how to translate a rating in one system to a rating in another. So yeah, I, so, so Yes, yeah, so I think I think it's more I think it's more optimistic that something like that will probably pop up at some point. So we're headed for a Celsius and Fahrenheit world, and yeah, yeah, pretty much. And yeah, I think the I think the conversion formula is going to be a little bit more complicated than between <laughs> Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit and Celsius, partly because like different ranges of the rating systems, yeah, actually different have different, speeds. yeah, different yeah. speeds exactly. They yeah, have different and speeds. Yeah, and to be clear, such sites already do exist, and they're they're gathering data quickly and doing a good job. It's just mm. it's a bit. I, I might have a unique job where it's uniquely frustrating because I'll say a rating because I and since I grew up with the USCF and FIDE system, that's what I default to. But mm. everyone's playing online now, so it just uh, confuses things. But yeah, anyway, um, we've kept you long enough, Mark. I really appreciate your time. There's been some amazing insights, uh, one of a kind. So uh, oh, really appreciate you. it. Oh, my pleasure. And if people want to keep up with your work or reach out to you, is there a way for them to do that? Well, probably the uh, the first best stop would be just to go to my website, which is uh, www.glico.net. Um, and, you know, my contact information is there and all kinds of other stuff that's kind of fun is up there, too. Excellent. Yeah. And I, I do encourage listeners to, re to read Mark's papers. They hold up well. And uh, I'll link to those and uh, the aforementioned Ken Regan stuff as well. Um, so thanks again, Mark. This has been awesome. Well, thank you. 
Thank you to everyone who listens to and supports the podcast. And most of all, thank you to my producer, Matthew Passy. Be sure to check us out on social media. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1. We also have a Perpetual Chess Facebook group where we continue the conversation about each episode. I've even got the Instagram page locked and loaded, actually posting clips every week. So you can follow at Perpetual Chess to catch some clips there. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, of course, uh, Chessable.com, the original sponsor of Perpetual Chess, Aim Chess, Chess Mood. Thanks. I'm proud to be affiliated with all of these sites. Um, Also want to thank Blue Wire Podcast, with whom I partner. Big shout out to Blue Wire. Check them out for sports podcasts. But most of all, I want to thank the individuals who helped make Perpetual Chess go via PayPal or Patreon. And of course, they get to find out the guests, send in questions, hear Uh, occasional GM lectures on Zoom, um, and even get ad-free podcasts. So thank you all for supporting Perpetual Chess and keeping it going. So without further ado, I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. Chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess blog. Shout out to JB. Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, The Apprentice Twitch Channel, Aniti Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porteau, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, The Charlotte Chess Center, The Chess Central's Chess Blog, Chessmood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Mitchell, I am Dimitri Schneider, Douglas Wilson, I am Eric Rosen, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, Greg Shahadi, Gregory Gullick, Hampus Axelson, James Kennedy, Jay Garrison, Jeff Martinson, Jeff Schaefer, Jeremy Nilsson, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John MacArthur, Kevin Forsyth, Kevin Gilmore, Kevin O'Callaghan, Kevin Pryor, King's Cell, King's Crusher YouTube channel, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nace Twitch channel, Peter McManus, GM Peter Prohaska, Peter Soddy, Philip Lummins, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Ray Lillywhite, Reuven Fisher, Robert Hansen, Ross Crossland, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of strongchess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a chess.com improver group, and Wayne Beam. I would also like to give thanks to Ace Viega, Adam Fowler, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Al Hastings, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, Antonio Cancino, Antonio Leonfort, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Bill Trammell, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brandon Halseed, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Cameron Davis, Ken Kabadayu, Sorry, Ken. Ken Kabadai, Chad Hilton, Chad Likens of Rose City Chess in Portland, Oregon, Chess for Charity in Jacksonville, Chess Patzer, Spain, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Kiefer, Chris Wainscott, Chris, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explain, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Caros, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Best, Dave Saylor, David Blaskotschek, David Brown, David Gores, David Hamblin, David Cramley, David Peterson, Dennis Parrish, FM, Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Edwin Rodriguez, Ethan Smith, Evan Rosenberg, Ewan Richardson, Ian Mason, Felipe Melo Perilla, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letarte Lavoie, uh, Frank Tortoris, MD, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Gautam Narula, uh, Gene Stewart, George Foote, George Harris, Giovanni Russo, Gregory Higgins, Han Shute, Harish Srinivasan, Howard V. Han, uh, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Muir, Jason Willem, Jay Tuttle, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jesse Damas, Dekumus, excuse me, Jesse, Jesse McNulty, Jim Ratliff, Jim Sadler, Joe DeSano, Joe Valdez, Joel Th- Thomas Ramos, John McAdams, John Tully, Juan Almaguer, 
Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Bannister, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Justin Goodfeller, Jen Shahadi, Joe Rocky, John Thompson, Grandmaster Josh Fridell, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovyutsky of Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Macaulay Peterson, Maria Emelyanova, AKA Photo Chess, Mark Chaves, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Mark Wilkins, Marco Bulatovich, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matt Ferrari, Matthew Allen Coughlin, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, Matthias Plock, the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Goble, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negma Milijanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, Pablo Davida, Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Eckert, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Queenside Management uh, Limited of Switzerland, Randall Montgomery, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hollenbach, Richard Tucker, Robert Callahan, Robert Turner, Robert Wall, Robert Wilson, Rory Coleman, Ryan Berg, Sampson Teaches Chess, Satyajit Malugu, The Say Chess, Publishing, Unstoppable, Empire, Scott McKinnon, Scott Rose, Sean Krauss, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Sergey McCagan, Seth Ruzica, Seth Will, Sean Tracy, Silver Knights in Richmond, Simon Schmidt, Stefan Roller, Stephen Miller, and Tom George, uh, WGM, Tatia Vabrahamian, Terry King, Thomas Brown, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, FM Timothy Wall, Tobiah Rex, Tom Edzel, Tommy Farron, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Beauchamp, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and last but never least, Zhivko, Zhivko Stoyanov. So thanks for listening, everyone. We will catch you all next week.